Uh, hey everybody, new podcast out with Lou Holcomb, who I have the pleasure of being with here in Florida. That uh, doesn't happen too often, so we figured we'd make a video together. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I hope it's helpful. Awesome. Yeah, Lou's conversation, some similar themes emerged from other podcasts, but what I really loved about it was Lou's incredibly vulnerable, shares mistakes she made as an early manager that um, she really wrestled with, figured out, developed personally, and has helped her lead uh, high-performing teams today. And I think changes in leadership style, if you're a new manager or you want to get into management, this is an awesome podcast because there is a part of it where you have to try things and just make mistakes. Lou shares that with us. But what I, my favorite part of knowing Lou is she's parlayed it into uh, incredible success today. So check it out and uh, the link will be in the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Friend, um, a, a customer, but also most importantly, head of contingent workforce at UKG today. And Lou, I do want you to walk people through your background, but before we do that and hear all the fun stuff about you, I do have to ask you some some boilerplate questions just to make sure the, the audience gets to know you. And since we're on beers and careers and you and I are being very um, studious, drinking our waters in this holiday time, preparing for the holidays, because mm -hmm. I know we both like to share a good um, glass of brown liquor from time to time. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite cocktail or drink? I've really been on a kick with something I found called Low and Slow Rock and Rye. It has bitters, honey, and orange peel. So basically, my go-to is an old-fashioned. I mm -hmm. would I would guess on this show that's probably a pretty, very predictable answer. <laughs> um, but I am a fan of Sam Felicity, and I definitely prefer a rye over a bourbon if there's a choice. Um, uh, you'll you'll appreciate you this, Mark. I actually tried Lagavulin recently and about died after sipping on that. It was like a campfire. <laughs> I, I'm not a fan at all. Do you have a favorite rye right now? Because I know that's probably like a very contested... slow and low. Yeah, okay. probably the slow and low or okay. bullet rye is good too. Yes, I've had the bullet rye. I want to say the whistle pig might have been a favorite on the podcast before. But I don't know, I don't know that one. I've had that. Um, I I'm googling slow and low rye so it's up on the browser for after and i can find it um do you like quotes any favorite quotes you'd share uh i do i heard one recently that's from victor frankel he's a austrian physicist and holocaust survivor and he said the last of human freedoms is the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances mm -hmm. i think that's very true uh, that I love that. I'm a, and I'm a big fan of Victor Frankl in the book Man's Search for Meaning because I think that's where he kind of documents his thoughts there. Um, I was always amazed when I read about Victor Frankl that going through that horrific time, he had the poise to think about what he could control, yeah. which is perfect for your quote. But uh, at times, just, at times for me, that feels like something more that I aspire to than I can really do day in and day out. Like I have to pause and be like, am I consciously doing it? So same. Yeah, that's definitely the I mean, that's what we're shooting for. So it, that's, not always not always perfect for sure. No, I love that. Good. That's a that's a great one. Uh, curse word. Favorite curse word. So I definitely don't discriminate when it comes to linguistic mischief. Uh, so <laughs> I I really think having a large arsenal at your disposal is best. But if I had to pick a favorite curse word, it's one that may only make sense to my family. So I'll give you some context. I have a nephew. Um, he's six and he holds a place in my heart that is uniquely his own. But he brings me immense joy. And the bond we share is just one of my most precious treasures. He also happens to be just really unknowingly hilarious all the time. And when he was just starting to talk, he was watching a cartoon. I think it was called Blaze, which is a monster truck show. If you're not familiar, every episode is roughly the same with different details. There's a monster truck named Crusher. He's the rival of Blaze. Yes. Have you heard of this? Okay. I think I, think I, <laughs> I, think I might know it. Yeah. Is, so, it, it's, is it red? The monster truck's red with a flame on the side? Yeah, Blaze is okay. red. Yeah. Crusher is always cheating to try to win or get an advantage. And one of the episodes really had my nephew's attention. And the time came when Crusher does his thing. It's always messed up, unfair, or hurtful in some way. And my nephew looked at me with a beyond disappointed look 
on his face, pointed at the TV and said, what the feck? <laughs> the, the inflection and cadence was so spot on. It caught me completely off guard. I knew what he meant. He knew what he meant. And he yes. got it wrong. <laughs> right. And then, and then you're trying to keep it together because you're like, I, I, mean, I think I'm supposed to discipline him right now, but this is too funny. <laughs> Yeah. So as a family, we say what effect now. Feel free to adopt. It yes. I, I love it. And you just solved the riddle for me because I Googled it while you were talking. And we have a monster truck in the house that my six year old and eight year old play with. And I was like, where's this from? Like, I'm like, this isn't from the movie Cars. Like, where is this from? So yeah, you just, Blaze you is just, popular. <laughs> Blaze is popular. You just tied the loop together for me. Um, favorite book, Lou? Or a favorite book you're reading? Doesn't have to be favorite book of all time. That's a very difficult question. Professionally, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown, so I've been listening to her Dare to yes. Lead right now. Um, but also, I've been trying to unplug a bit more for the health of my sanity, my own sanity. Um, and actually, my sister and I just read all of Jane Austen, which was pretty okay. cool. Very yeah, cool. that was pretty cool. It's a cool thing to also like have a reason to talk to your sister about. That's different yeah. from normal stuff. Yeah. It's Very definitely cool. been fun. We argue about like our ranking of them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, yes. You're definitely wrong. That is not. <laughs> <laughs> Classic that sibling. is not the best one. Yeah. Classic sibling. Well, as we talk about your career, I will like to know the last last boilerplate question here. What is, what was your first job? First paying job? So I guess technically I would say like cutting lawns and babysitting, although that's yeah. off the books. So. <laughs> No, that counts, books, by the way. First... That, that off the okay. books counts. I like the off the books one. So your so your first like time you got paid babysitting and cutting lawns. For sure, yeah. I was the oldest of eight kids, so I was always babysitting <laughs> from yeah. as long as I can remember. You know, I, you need a, a a B team when you have eight kids. Uh, <laughs> so the oldest daughter just comes in. But um, I also cut a lot of grass because, I mean, I live in Texas. It's always hot here. The grass grows. So it was always a way for you to make extra money. And having eight kids, there's never enough to go around. So if you could earn right. your own, it was very helpful. Exactly. And you're outside, probably away from your siblings at times when you needed it. Yeah, for sure. That was always a plus. Great. <laughs> that's proud, a, that's, crowded in that house. Yeah, that's, a, uh, that's an awesome one, I will admit. I share some of that. I I, uh, I picked up. I was working some odd jobs, but I picked up a good couple of loops of uh, cutting grass in high school for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so talk to us. First real, first kind of real job. I'm guessing in true beers and careers fashion, you had no idea that you'd be running contingent, a contingent workforce program yeah. at a massive company when Lou was 16, 18, 22. <laughs> I'm gonna guess. Guess yeah, no, I people say that, right? Nobody, no kid dreams of getting into this industry. We all <laughs> fall into it somehow. Sucks um, you in. Yeah, but but it is a really great fit for me. I know my pathway is probably pretty abnormal, um, but it's they're all building blocks. I've learned so much each step of the way that it just made sense. I just kept doing my best and got the next opportunity and took advantage of all the things that I learned along the way. So. It might be a little abnormal, but sure. You want me to walk you through it? Yeah, like the, like we sat down, I don't know, with that March or May. I, I will admit some of the days or the months <laughs> this year have kind of come together. But I remember you being like, well, I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. And I was like, please. I was like, please don't tell me another thing. I want to talk to you about this on the podcast. Yeah. So I've been waiting for a while to hear this story. So talk to me about it. Yeah, so I joined the Army while I was still in high school, and I left right after graduation. Um, I, I did the test. You know, they the recruiters always come around and offer all the high schoolers the test, and they were like, you scored perfect. You could do anything that you wanted. I was like, anything? Okay, what do you got? And so they brought me to the careers website, and I looked around, and they were like, well, you could be a, a linguist if you want. Are you good at learning languages? And I was like, I do okay in class, like in German class in high school. And so they sent me for another test. It's it's a pretty cool test. It's to see if you have the capacity to learn languages. Some brains are, I guess, uh, it's a little bit easier for some. And that test was really cool. I scored super well. And they were like, you scored where you would qualify for any level language. And I was like, mm. oh, shoot, they're going to give me Arabic. Mind you, this was 2007. <laughs> yes. Okay. So... 
Um, I was like, I'm going to get Arabic for sure. But I didn't. I ended up getting Russian. So um, they it's just needs of the army. I don't think mm-hmm. they really um, take your preference or anything. It's just needs of the army. So I went to a, a language school in Monterey, California. I think they put it somewhere so beautiful because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, okay. it is a very difficult school. Uh, you get one year to become proficient in a level three language of Russian. Wow. Yeah, it's rough. They, wow. you know, compare it to the drinking out of a fire hose. So I did that and I uh, went to the school to actually learn how to be a linguist. And um, I was in just about four years, um, but I was injured. And so then I got damaged to my spine. And that really kept me from continuing. Um, And when I got out, I didn't use anything that they gave me. And I think it was out of spite because I was Mm. young and pretty angry, frankly, Mm. um, that they invested so much in my brain. And just because my body failed me, I couldn't continue. But Mm. that's the that's kind of how the army is. You're a soldier first, right? Yeah. So I was a soldier first, linguist second. Yeah. Interesting. And like. They only give you a year, and I know this isn't like exactly what you do every day, not to spend a ton of time on this, but like, are, are you just like, I know they te- you said they teach you how to be a linguist first, and then they immerse you in it. Are you just speaking Russian all day long? Like, like I can't think no, of any way, like, to immerse. It's more listening, right? So that the uh, job of a linguist is, you know, you're just in a, a facility, Um, You know, it's part of military intelligence, so it's all classified. You're in a a room with no windows, sometimes underground. It's freezing because there's Mm -hmm. a lot of machines in there. And you're just listening um, to try to capture signals intelligence through your headphones in the the language. And it's mostly static. And (laughs) um, so if I hear static on a TV now, I'm almost asleep immediately. It's like (laughs) it's like a like a trick. Turns Um, you off. Wow. Yeah. But. But it's uh, it's definitely not as cool as everybody probably thinks. It's pretty nerdy, I would say. Yeah, but I think, uh, like, uh, I have no military experience, like, firsthand. Um, but when I think about the military, and especially from, like, the staffing and recruiting world that we live in, mm-hmm. like, you just talking about the tests you took and the processes and procedures and, like, how they get them the training to get people up to speed. It's always um, It's always been something that I've just found fascinating. Yeah, I think the Army is really where my love for efficiency started because it was so inefficient that I was like, Mm. "Mm, I could do this much better. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's so interesting. So then unfortunately, you get injured, honorably Mm -hmm. discharged. Well, how do you go? Where do you go from there? So that civilian transition was tough, but I found my way into HR at a small cabling company before while I was in high school. Also, I didn't mention, but I I did. a part-time HR assistant role in high school before I left for the army. Okay. So when I, when I transitioned back, I found my way to HR again through that small cabling company. And that gig really opened some doors for me to a benefits role in an organization through a staffing agency. So this is really the beginning. Um, And it was a benefits role. So that contract led me to various HR roles until that HR staffing uh, agency actually called me back and offered me an internal role within their organization, which was a, a recruiter slash talent manager for the same client that I had been supporting as a contractor in my very first benefits role at that agency. So it kind of came full circle. Wow. Very, very cool. And then you and then from what I understand, you spent some time there. Yeah, too long. <laughs> yeah. Too, I, oh, I, okay. I, Talk about that. I I did. I moved through the ranks by accepting another internal role. I moved to their national team, then senior national recruiter to national recruiting manager to site manager to operations manager. And I just uh, learned from everyone I could along the way. It became a bit of what they called like a fixer, Mm. right? Traveling around to different maybe struggling sites and making things easier where I could. Um, Often my team was handling clients that were sold that didn't really fit any established model within the organization. So I'll give you some examples, like like a pop-up shop, right? Or um, a medical study that's like national and across a whole bunch of different locations and it's just one visit per location. So it was it, it was projects that were complex. They had a lot of factors and they weren't just a traditional 
staffing model, right? Mm -hmm. We would design a custom solution and make it work. So um, that's kind of where I got my passion for just listening, figuring out what the need was and designing something that worked for everyone. Now, you joked and said you were there for too long. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> well, um, designing solutions for something that didn't fit the typical model for a long time also just meant remote work. So mm -hmm. when COVID pushed everyone into remote work, it felt like we had a bit of a head start and it got intense very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I was chasing the dream of an area vice president role, but when okay. I, it was it was within reach and COVID just really prompted a reality check for me. Um, burnout, long hours, misplaced priorities. Mm -hmm. I just was not where I needed to be and it showed. I was mm -hmm. starting at 5 a.m. I was ending at 11 p.m because I had established my own standards that I held myself to long ago, which up to a certain point had really helped me before it became my own end. Um, I had no boundaries. I wasn't sleeping well. I was burnt out. And I put myself in a position where I just could not continue. Do you, um, that's, that is a fascinating conversation because the balance of that is very difficult, right? Like at this, yeah. well, I'm hearing you say, the reason I'm successful and about to become area vice president is because I have this work ethic. But at the same time, it's your Achilles heel. Like, were you always wired that way, work ethic wise? And like, how, how did it snowball from your perspective? Well, I just always wanted to do a great job. I, I don't really get much fulfillment if I'm not able to do things well, mm. you know? So I think that's really where it comes from is it's not just that I want to do a good job um, for for the sake of the work. I want to do a good job for me. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, so um, I think it just started to snowball when I didn't feel a lot of support. OK. And and, and then and you mentioned COVID, too, right? That was a mm -hmm. seminal moment through it. Yeah, the whole world changed, right? Yeah. Very quickly. And I think the um, finish line moved very quickly and it kept moving and kept moving. And there was a lot of uncertainty and I wasn't really comfortable in uncertainty yet. I had a lot of maturing to do. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that being comfortable in uncertainty, Brene Brown actually talks about that a lot. Being comfortable mm. in uncertainty is is a strength. And I, I hadn't developed that. So um, it was just kind of the perfect storm of the world, the struggle in the world, um, not having the support that I thought I needed, and then not having any personal boundaries, not reaching out for help. It was just kind of everything all at once. How did you um, handle leaving? Was that really difficult too? Because you were there for oh, a while. Extremely, yeah, it was extremely yeah. difficult. It's It's hard because you have put so much time into this goal and it almost felt like in my mind that I wasted a lot of time by not accomplishing the goal but you know now when I think about it I just made that goal up <laughs> right and nobody true true <laughs> and and like you kicked it off by saying that all of your experiences kind of parlayed into mm -hmm. what you do today which was the genesis of this podcast was I I had a I had a dad um it was very much the opposite of my mom. They were great. But like my dad would always be like, what are you going to be when you grow up when I'd come home from college or high school? Mm -hmm. And my mom would jokingly be like, leave him alone. Like he's just figuring it out. Yeah. And then I met all these people like yourself who has a passion for what they do every day. And then you look at their LinkedIn profile or you get to talking to them. And it's like, you did not start out ever thinking this was the future. Yeah. Um, that's crazy how often it happens. And that's why I love documenting these stories, how did you parlay the boundary piece into your next roles? Like, like, how do you not let that become an issue today? Because I think a lot of people struggle with this now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I after I um, left, I, I did an HR consulting gig, and that really brought a lot of relief for me. It, and it let me be creative without that weight of the ultimate responsibility on me because I do take that very seriously and that kind of helped me break the cycle of immen the immense pressure that I put on myself so I was able to gain some perspective and then just reflecting on what mattered I made some commitments to myself mm. right that um this isn't the army it isn't life and death it's work right yeah. and yeah. everybody's gonna be just fine um mm -hmm. 
if I log off today and, and revisit it tomorrow. Honestly, I'm, I, I've, I'm better when I'm rested, right? We know this. There's science. You need sleep. So much, Your brain so much operates science. so much better, you know? Um, if you're stuck, it's probably because you're working too hard, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. So step away. And I, I realized that. I think, too, I realized I was trying to be who my leadership were trying to guide me to be. Mm. Not in a way that I think was malicious in any way, of course, just trying to help me be successful, right? I have tattoos. I am a um, l- lesbian woman who looks pretty gay. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, right? just own it. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. they were trying to kind of guide me. They didn't want some somebody else's bias to kind of um, hinder my success. So mm. they would kind of say, hey, I would probably wear long sleeves, right? Mm. Or just things like that. And and those kinds of small comments really add up. And so I didn't feel comfortable being myself. So yes. that's part of it, too. I, I'm now very comfortable bringing my whole self. And it's actually made me exceptional. I, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be able to perform any better. I'm at the peak of my performance because I'm doing it the Lou way. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's much easier than trying to be someone else. Uh, at, at, when you're on the side of the journey you're on, I think for sure. I think it's, 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 impre- that's an impressive story. A, I think the thing that I think about too, is like, it's probably a problem with the service industry. Like I live in the service industry right? right? and you do too, but you yeah. do it to an internal stakeholder where there's a little bit more like, I guess, acceptance of who you are from the get go kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I do, I, your comment resonates with me in terms mm-hmm. of well, I'm always meeting new people mm-hmm. and I, and unfortunately there's so much judgmentalness that happens and you can yeah, judge before even, to, they have their biases, you know, they do. And, you, and you don't know people who they are, right? You're, you're you getting to know them. Yes. So it's, it, it's you it's, don't want to, you don't want to, um, you don't want to create a, a, an extra challenge for yourself when, you know, creating relationships and trying to get the buy-in of the customers hard enough, you know? Right. And I think that that's really where the guidance came from, but it has a downside and it does impact your confidence. It impacts your approach. It's, it impacts your ability to be vulnerable and authentic, which is really what resonates with people, right? Yes. It, yes. They can feel it, that. And mm-hmm. it, even if you are really smart and you have great project management skills and you're a great listener and you're really good at pulling people together and getting everyone on the same page and, you know, making sure that we're all bought into the vision and then, you know, getting the execution knocked out in the most efficient way. Those are all great things. But if people aren't bought into you and don't feel that you're authentic and genuine, I don't think you have their true buy-in, right? They're, mm. They think this is a good decision, but they're not yes. behind you. Right? There's a value prop that makes sense, but mm-hmm. not a belief in what we're doing. Right. Yeah. Which that I is, think that's what it takes. Yeah. I, I. Do you also feel like after, like the commitments, you mentioned I made commitments to myself. Mm-hmm. Like, talk to me about that. Like, are you writing these commitments down? Are you sharing them with a partner? Uh, yeah. a family member like like for you because like I'm a weirdo like I do have my goals in a Google Doc and I review them and like my wife always makes fun of me because she's not like this and so at Christmas time around this time of year I'm always like can we go through this stuff and like yeah she's like yes Mark we can like kind of <laughs> rubbing me but um or ribbing me is the right word but like Talk to me about that. Like, how do you go through that process? Because that's just, that's some serious self-discovery. It's one thing to be aware of it. It's another thing to consciously ch- want to change and then commit to changing. Those are, the, the, you kind of glossed over that. Like, as oh, yeah, and then I made these commitments to myself. But in yeah. my experience, talking to other people, that, you know, that isn't easy. Right. So um, my nephew is actually a big inspiration for the majority of my commitments. Awesome. Um, Because it's his schedule, right? Um, So my sister got pregnant pretty young and she moved in with my wife and I. So my nephew and sister have lived with us the majority of his life. 
And so um, we're kind of the second string of his grown up world. Right. Yeah. And uh, so we've been together too long now. We can't separate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, so, my God. Yeah. That's the family. Uh, so when he gets out of school, I stop. Right. When he gets home, I stop and I won't go back to it unless he's asleep. Mm, that's one. Cool. And and I'm only going to go back to it if he's asleep, if it's really critical and cannot wait until the morning. And mm. And I will ask that question of whoever's waiting on it, mm-hmm. right? I, I don't try to, I think often in my past, I was making an assumption about the priority level that someone else had in their mind, which wasn't the truth, right? Um, mm-hmm. It was kind of a mixture of what I assumed was important to them instead of asking. And then this level of kind of pride that I had of delivering the best quickly, right? Yes, constantly. And so now I talk to that with my partner, right? I, whoever's trying to wait on this, whatever I'm trying to de- deliver with them, I ask them, hey, is this critical that you have tomorrow? Here's what we have going on. Do you think that it can wait? Normally it can, because like yeah. I said, it's not life and death, mm. you know? It's such an so, American thing, too. It is. Yeah. It's it such is. an American thing. Now that, now that I'm part of a global team, I can really, really see that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like, very obvious. I yeah. got a, I was fortunate to spend some time living abroad. And I, like, I remember being there like in the third week, being like, man, I think I've been going too hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like people are just not acting like this elsewhere. Um, yeah, you know, too, this this move to remote work. I've been working remotely since 2006. Yeah, so I had a little bit of a head, you had start. head start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does creep into your life. Um, corporations, I think, are actually benefiting from this. If if it's someone like me, right? If people who have kind of my personality type where I'm very driven, right? And honestly, I will take things way too far. So I have to be reeled in, yes. <laughs> right? I don't have to be motivated. I have to be reeled in. So I have the opposite problem. And when it's in my house and I can get to it or it's in my pocket on my phone and I have notifications, I'm kind of thinking about work all the time. It's, it is so difficult. I, I, um, I sucked at working from home. Yeah. Like not only did I do some of what you said of like not shutting it off, but I also can like walk by a doorknob that needs to get fixed and go fix it. And then all of a sudden like <laughs> look down, like I, like I, like I, I suck on both ends of the spectrum in full disclosure. Yeah. And it, it's funny you talk about like knowing yourself and like, I'm very fortunate. I only have a 15, 20 minute commute to work. And yeah, for me, nice. and for me, it's like kind of a decompression time. So when I get home mm-hmm. and I have to see when I get to see my children and my family, I can like be present. So yeah. I've, used it but I was thinking about earlier this week being like I I think I would have to go through a whole new I think I could do remote work if I you know we 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 have people that work remote at our company all the time yeah I just I I I need I'm like I'm just such an old dog but I know who I am kind of thing yeah to your point exactly there's no right answer for everyone and I think that's kind of the beauty of of you know, a, a lot of organizations approach to, yes. you know, if it brings value or if it makes sense for you, then yeah, come back to the office. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't, you know, we know that you're capable. You've been doing a great job for years now. It showed mm-hmm. us that, you know, this works. It but, does. um, it really does. you know, for me, actually, I think that I probably wouldn't have been able to hustle as much as I did if I didn't work from home because I talked to you about my spine injuries right there's days where I have really bad back days and Mm. I also experience a lot of numbness and so sometimes I can't drive right and I think that that's made a huge difference not for me I'm not the only person with a disability who's been empowered by remote work it's yeah it's a huge huge impact to the uh, disabled community right so I know at least for the disabled veteran community that I'm a part of, everyone's yeah. beyond grateful that, you know, the world moved in this way. So many more opportunities as well for people. Never right. mind, never mind the ability to get work done differently, but now it created more opportunities for folks. I yeah, I've always felt, you know, we we really we just instituted more of a formal policy, probably the last company in America to do so, because because <laughs> we're small and we have that to our advantage, right? But um when we, t- when we were talking about the work from home policy, it was always like, can't we just treat humans like humans? Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't like, 
would I prefer people? Would I prefer to see people? Sure. A couple days a week? Sure. But like, do people have to go to doctor's appointments and get their kids off the bus and, and yeah, things don't yeah. work off? It's like, well, that's a human dealing with human things. And I think mm -hmm. work should augment that. So it is, it's, a, it's a really, it's kind of goes hand in hand with your whole point of like knowing who you are and what works mm -hmm. for you. And when, and when you started to really embrace, like, I'm going to say not giving a fuck about, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, that's kind of what you're talking about. And you, you, I know you're not using such crude terms, but <laughs> when you started being like, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I, I wouldn't even say selfish. You're just going to do what's right for you. So you're comfortable yeah. in your own skin. Did you also find that you started to find other layers of self-improvement that you didn't even realize were there? A hundred percent. And also people were, it, it made me feel good because other people were inspired to do the same. Mm. <laughs> they were mm -hmm. like, oh, it just makes me so comfortable because you're so real. And I'm like, mm. we, we all should be right. Yes. Um, and it, and it gives people permission, I think. So, um, I think it's really made me better at asking for feedback, which is a gift, right? So I, I regularly ask for feedback. I'll end a call and ping someone, hey, any feedback about how how that worked? Because I know I want I want to develop in these areas. And if you notice something that I could do better, or when you give a, you know a presentation that you, you maybe need to tweak for the audience every now and then, but the messaging is the same. You're going to get better and better with every audience if you keep asking for feedback. And so I've uh, taken advantage of that. And so since I am just comfortable being myself and comfortable saying, being the first person to say, I don't know, let's find out. Yes. <laughs> right. It yes. also makes me a lot more comfortable to say, you know, we're stronger together. I, I really value everybody else's perspective and, you know, I, I'm open to help. And if you see something in me, that's an area of improvement. I, I want to know about it. So right. I think it is uh, just being vulnerable really has given me a perspective to, to make my personal development a priority. Through the, through the, like on your journey to the person, like not not on your journey to personal development. That's a terrible sentence because you're always living that. But through that time of like the transition out of the burnt out phase into like I'm taking a break into this this mm -hmm. new thing that's got you all jacked up. Um, did you have someone that was like shepherding you or mentoring yeah. you along the way? Yes, and okay. she was exceptional. <laughs> Okay. So, um, is it your she, wife? <laughs> no, but she was definitely part of it. I wasn't yeah. speaking about her, but she was absolutely supportive, a hundred percent. Um, but I was talking about a uh, kind of a, a mentor, and she, um, she's an organizational development professional, okay. and she has her own own company, right? And um, I was introduced to her through a mutual connection, and she was helping them, and um, just started to give me some insight about things that I could change and I was open to hearing it and then I got really comfortable and just asked her would you be willing to mentor me for a bit right and she was like yes I'd be honored and so it was really great to have that sounding board of somebody else who was um, trying to develop in the same ways and had the same passion for bringing people together and trying to get the right audiences on on the same page. That's really my skill, I would say, <laughs> is uh, I, I'm just, you know, good at connection, con making yeah. connections. And that and and alignment, everything and alignment. else kind of falls. Yeah, everything else kind of fall, falls in place if you make sure that you give room to everybody to contribute, right? Yes. And she taught me a lot. She was my sounding board. I was able to check in with her about, you know, next steps. And she really did help me make the decision that I wasn't searching for a job. I was searching for a company and a culture. Uh, so when I was reflecting on what mattered, I knew I couldn't go back to staffing. And I actually focused on really finding the right organization instead. And that was because of her advice. And yeah. I think that's been hugely helpful i still check in with her i also have some extra mentors i have a couple i have an industry yeah. mentor i have a career mentor i have a um, personal growth mentor right so um the more the merrier I, I, when you said to me that you um now get so much you're so much more comfortable asking for feedback and you do mm -hmm. it all the time my literal thought process was oh lou just has mentors everywhere 
Like that was my <laughs> gut reaction was like, she views everyone as like a feedback loop to help continually um, make progress. Yeah. And it, and it's not purely just from my own personal development, but I also, um, part of UKG that, that really resonated with me was at some point I read where it said, they believe that everybody deserves a great manager. And I was like, mm. yes, okay, this yeah. is this is fantastic. So it was not just a commitment to me as an employee, but it was also you're a people leader and this mm. is a commitment that you're making, right? Yes. You're, you need to be a great manager. So then I took that uh, very seriously. <laughs> and so whenever I ask for feedback from my team, especially, it's not just for me, it's to make sure that I'm showing up in the way they need me to and providing what they need to uh, feel empowered and to bring their best and to be their true self as well. So it, feedback isn't just doesn't just benefit you; benefits really everybody that you interact with. Is uh, I love I love you're so right. By the way, feedback helps everybody. Do you? We didn't get to talk about it a whole lot, but like you've been in a management and leadership role for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and exposed to a lot of it, including including being a manager and leader when Lou wasn't Lou, yeah. for lack of a better way of saying it. Can you maybe talk about the differences and how that's yeah. changed through the course of your career? And I'd love to hear your riff on leadership, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, I I definitely have not had it. I, I've been a bad manager. A hundred percent. I've been a bad manager. Um, I, I think about it all the time. My sister actually is very inspiring. I used to, I, I served at a restaurant with her at a, at a certain point in my career when I didn't make much and I needed a second gig. Um, but everyone was telling me, they're like, oh, I love, my sister's name is Shelby. They said, oh, I love when Shelby's the manager, the shift manager. When I get to work with Shelby, I just love it. I love coming to work. And I was like, wow, that's that's a great compliment. Yes. I was just so impressed by my sister. She just made And the it job's fun. not that different. How different is the job versus yeah. the other manager, right? Yeah, it's it's not, right? But you, your manager makes or breaks your experience and I and I've definitely have been a negative impact on on my team's experience in my past. Um, but I learned a lot from my mistakes and I never want to make anyone feel the way that I have in my past. So I do take that very seriously. Um, and I also try to be the most approachable manager you've ever met to where if I do mess up, I want you to tell me because I don't um, I'm not committing that I'll always get it right. I'm committing that I'll always get better. Mm. Right. So if if my team feels comfortable in saying, Lou, this kind of sucks. <laughs> um, is there a different way that we could do this? Um, then I feel like that means I'm doing my job if they feel comfortable enough to come to me and say, um, what you're doing doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Or I love this and let's keep doing it. So um, for me, I think it's just having a lot of empathy. And I usually hang up my calls now. This is part of the commitments I made to myself. Um, whenever I hang up the call, my calls now, I always ask myself, um, does the other person or the other people on the call think that that was uh, valuable? And do I think that they would look forward to talking to me again and I mm-hmm. make their day better, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that really helped me. That's, that's helped me say, oh, okay. And and I'm and the answer is not always yes. Sometimes I'm like, well, I didn't really get to give them the answer that they loved. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, and so I'll follow up. Right. If the answer is that in my head, I'll follow up and say, hey, let's regroup on this because I, you know, I I know I wasn't able to give you what you needed, but I'm here to brainstorm. Let's strategize. Let's figure out what we can do. Right. Um, So I I think that that's a really helpful tool if you're hanging up your calls and just thinking about um, the impact that you have on everybody else. I think they call it a leadership shadow. So I learned a lot about that. Um, And I'm just trying to get better every day. That's a that is a wonderful advice. I think the best advice you could give to someone who's in management, but but management and leadership are different, right? Management is like a title. Leadership is when people actually want to do or yeah. you can galvanize people towards a cause. And I think, you know, it's funny I was talking with new uh new leaders in our org or tangential to our org that I, I reached out to. You, you 
earlier in their career. And it's like, all you have to do is worry about, did I add value today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's a different litmus test. And it's really hard, I think, to go from individual contributor to that mindset because you don't feel like you're always getting something done. I don't know. Did you feel that way? A hundred percent. I think at yeah. one point I told my boss at the time, I was like, I just feel like my job is getting on calls now. I don't feel like I actually do anything. <laughs> It's and so that was true. like right at the shift into leadership, right? Where mm. I was, you know, less execution, more strategy. And so yes. um, th that is a difficult shift to go through. You do have this sense of delivery, right? Where I am yes. supposed to be delivering something. And um, yeah, now you're helping people, yes. right? You're empowering people to deliver. You're making sure that you get um, challenges out of their way. You're giving them guidance. You're being their sounding board. You're empowering them to feel like they have, um, you know, the autonomy to make something innovative and awesome happen, right? Um, making them, you know, understand that they should be confident and you selected them as part of your team for a reason and they are exceptional people and you're lucky to have them because that's the truth, right? Mm. It's I'm not um, what makes our team great. They are. <laughs> yes. So um, that's what I try to stay focused on. Well, and if you live it, it's evident, right? Like, I, like, I think we're both millennials, technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think technically. So we're millennial leaders. I, I'll tell you, I'm interested in your feedback. Something that I feel like I struggle with is when you are in leadership, when you fail, you fail publicly, so to speak. There's, yes. there's way more of a bright light on failure. And I think that uh, in certain times, you ride waves of success that get um, just just completely stopped by a failure that is then public. And there's this just like, there's there's the ego piece, which I think is like mm -hmm. okay to deal with. Your, your Victor Frankl quote of like, well, all I can do is control my thoughts in this moment. And, and I do mm -hmm. lean on stuff like that in that moment. But more like, how, like when that stuff happens in your world, and I hope I've articulated like a scenario, so to speak for yeah. you, like, like how are you dealing with, with that? Because it's not easy, it's um, very public. Yeah. Well, I am an emotional person and I don't lean away from that, actually. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that it's really, really powerful. I think, you know, I, I people will say that in work. It's not personal. It's not personal. Yeah. It is for me. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. because I show up authentically. It's kind of so my life. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of <laughs> what I think about all the time. So it is definitely personal for me. Um, so true. And so. It does hurt. It's painful. I actually saw this meme one, meme one time that was said, be, being a millennial, let's talk about it. You're, gonna say, you're um, really teeing this up for us on the millennial. Yeah, yeah. Thing. <laughs> I saw this meme one time. I was like, what are you going to do about it? And I was like, well, first I'm going to cry about it. And then I'm yes. going to boss up. <laughs> yes. But I do think that, like, it's funny because, like, um, different challenges I've had in my career and, like, I will look back and be like, well, I wonder why I like I beat myself up so much about that. But but at the same time, like if you if you weren't in touch with those emotions, I don't think it like adds to the toolbox of experience for you to make a different decision or handle it a different way in the future. Like I yeah. like I do think there is the period where you gotta like go through it. It just sucks. Yeah. I think feeling it has helped me though, because um I sit it with it a little bit longer if I let myself feel the emotions and then I get to think. So I, when I think about it longer, I usually come up with a better solution about how I'm going to respond. You know, yes. if I didn't, if I really didn't care or did, it wasn't personal, um, I, I don't think that I would come up with as creative solutions that really um, are enhancements from my mistakes. Right. I don't just want to undo the mistake. I want to, I want to make an enhancement. So um, I, I think that, feeling your emotions about it and, and really thinking about it, um, it, it, it gives you time to be creative and come up with, you know, turning it into an advantage. Because if I'm going to, if I'm going to hurt my own feelings about something, we're at least going to make it worth it. <laughs> uh, well, and, and like, I feel like, you, you know, you've talked about um, uh, you figuring out who Lou is you talk mm -hmm. like I'd call that self-discovery sounds so like huge, yeah. but that's what it is. And 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 then you talk about you just mentioned, well, I am an emotional person, but like I, it's funny. I have a mentor that constantly tells us, wind your watch. Like in the meaning is like 
when something happens, you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to respond. Like just yeah, go, just wait. go sit on that. Like sit mm-hmm. on it. We, uh, not acting, is an action. Yeah. yeah. And an and an option. And I and I think that's kind of what I'm hearing you say too. Is like I I pause now, mm-hmm. and I think about what's going to go on, and I go, yep, this happened. I can't control anything that's going to that happened previously because it already did happen. But I can control my, the outcome yeah. from where we go from here. Yeah, I'm going to feel it for a while and I'm going to really think about how I'm going to respond instead of, you know, previously when I was a poor leader, it it is honestly because I was not emotionally intelligent and highly reactive. It's hard to become a good leader, I don't think, without being a bad one or watching a bad one intimately. True. I I feel like I got both in the military. Me me too. Well, in the military, (laughs) I've definitely had both through both uh, teachers I've had. Uh, coaches and the athletic mm-hmm. background and then in the obviously in the real world um and, you, and once you start to see it it's very hard to not see it anymore yeah that's yeah. the one that's the one curse, <laughs> that's yeah, the one curse. for sure you know? I, but I'm also very transparent now with my leaders to just say exactly yeah. what I need right what I'm able to just communicate to my leaders exactly what I need now because I think I want to empower them to be good leaders too and if I'm not communicative how can they be right exactly well it's evident lou by the momentum the organization has under your leadership and uh and and where that's gone and i just um man I, this is the problem you and i could talk for hours i uh <laughs> i you know that 45 minutes fl- flies by i just want to say um thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh mm-hmm. and sharing your wisdom i think you getting vulnerable and sharing your own journey, but also how that's impacted the way you operate as a manager and leader is so helpful because I think there's a lot of people going through the remote work challenges that are present today. You had a, mm-hmm. you had a little bit of an extra experience that people can lean yeah. on, but also um, I think if you don't know who you you are, you can't really ever lead others, and I think that that's evident through your story as well. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. You know, you like, I know you like quotes. There's another one that just came to my mind, but uh, someone shared with me recently, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Amen. Right? Isn't so, that, isn't that you're the truth? Be stronger when you get through the hard times. So it's okay if there's mistakes and rough patches. I love it. That's a phenomenal way for us to wrap it. Um, thanks so much, Lou, for coming on oh. and uh, catch you soon. Hi, right, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Bye. Bye.